Okay, our next speaker, Dr. Jeremy Solon, comes, from, comes to us from the University of Wisconsin. He's a lifelong environmentalist and educator, a father, and he is another key member of the Think Water team. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeremy Solon. All right, can you hear me all right? Good, good afternoon, it's great to see you all. So my goal for this talk is to share a few of the things that I have learned uh, as an educator implementing programs and providing training in systems thinking. Before I do that, I just want to provide a little bit of background and context uh, to my work and perspective. <clears throat> so I came to systems thinking as an educator uh, from a uh, sustainability perspective. I was interested in sustainability. And of course I knew that it was important to understand our environment and our relationship uh, with it from a systems perspective. But I was also really interested in thinking. But as an educator, I, re I had really no idea how people think, how to teach thinking, or how I as an educator could structure information uh, to encourage thinking. That all changed when I uh, was introduced to DSRP through Think Water. Um, and as we know, and as we've heard, DSRP uh, integrates in understanding of how systems work, uh, system sciences, and uh, of how we think, and in particular, the, the patterns of thinking. That introduction, uh, as Laura said, led me uh, to be directly involved and now I'm part of uh, the Big Water uh, project. <clears throat> so as you saw a little bit in the, the video, uh, Think Water is a national water education campaign funded by USDA, uh, US Department of Agriculture, NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And USDA funded Think water because it noticed something. It noticed that there was no shortage of education programs, good water education programs. There was no shortage of good research. There's no shortage of good researchers, no shortage of good projects overall. Uh, the thing that was, was in shortage was positive impact on the health and sustainability of the water. Uh, and so they uh, provided funding to Think Water uh, to try and do something different. Uh, and the aim of Think Water is to, is to integrate systems thinking into uh, water research, water education, and water extension, which is uh, core to the design of land grant uh, universities, but it's also a powerful triad for advancing and applying knowledge uh, in any kind of situation. <clears throat> and we really believe the integration of these efforts is essential to help us address uh, wicked water problems. So uh, our mission is to, as you can see, engage, educate, and empower uh, the systems thinkers to solve wicked water problems. And that's the work uh, that I'm fortunate to be able to do. So much of my work focuses on applying systems thinking in the Wisconsin water space. Uh, and we're primarily focused on two uh, program areas in Wisconsin. The first one is Wisconsin Water Thinkers Network, which is, as the name suggests, the network to build the capacity of those involved with uh, water education, water extension, water research uh, in the state. And the second program is Wisconsin Water School, which is a program to provide in-depth systems thinking training for educators who then deliver programs in their communities. And uh, we're basically implementing, innovating, and learning from these experiences in, in Wisconsin uh, with the idea that we can take what we've learned there and what we've done there and apply it to other places. So we're developing a toolkit resources and strategies that we'll be sharing with other places that want to implement similar programs. So uh, needless to say, I've been involved with implementing systems thinking and water programming, and I've been involved in helping others to learn and apply DSRP in their programs and organizations. So what I'm going to share next uh, comes from my point of view as an educator who is interested in overcoming the barriers for people to adopt uh, DSRP in their programs and organizations. So I'm going to share uh, three challenges that we've run into in implementing um, teaching and uh, sharing DSRP. And then I'll share a few tricks, strategies, and resources that we've developed uh, to overcome those challenges. So the first uh, challenge that we've run into is what we call the identity of, of systems thinkers. And these are generally folks who have <clears throat> been learning about systems thinking for quite a while. They're early adopters of uh, the earlier waves of systems thinking, as Derek presented earlier, hard systems and soft systems waves of systems thinking. 
in a workshop or in conversation with these people almost always identify immediately to me that they're systems thinkers. And they usually tell me for how many years they've been systems thinkers. Uh, first thing they tell me. Um, and I know that they're gonna be a bit of a challenge because often they come not as learners, but as checkers to see if what I'm gonna present aligns with how they understand systems thinking. Of course, it's not a bad thing to identify as a systems thinker, that's a good thing. Uh, the challenge comes in in thinking that they already have all the answers and they're not open to learning uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, and, and given that DSRP is a new systems logic, there's an aspect of unlearning as much as there is a, an aspect of learning as, as Derek already mentioned. So one of the things that we find helpful uh, in introducing them to is uh, this, the fourth wave of systems thinking. This validates their work and understanding an earlier wave of systems thinking and provides them an opportunity to learn uh, the underlying theory of DSRP uh, in relation to what they already understand. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna spend any more time since we already heard about the fourth wave, but I just wanna reinforce that this is a really important uh, development for systems thinkers to understand. The second thing uh, that is a barrier uh, that we've run into uh, comes from a lack of understanding of the power of mental models. And we've seen quite a bit of this today, uh, but people generally uh, completely lack the awareness that we hold mental models and understand the world through mental models. <clears throat> and perhaps more importantly, people think that their understanding of the world is reality. They have hold a strong uh, reality bias, that is. They think how they see the world is how the real, the real world is. So this is the first thing uh, that I show folks in workshops. We've seen this already. Uh, but this is the essential understanding of mental models. Uh, and it provides you know, this relationship between our understanding of the world, our mental models, and what the real world is. Uh, and the learning process is basically a process of just continuing to get a closer approximation of reality with our mental models. Of course, we can never have reality uh, you know, in our heads, uh, but we can get better approximations, and that's the process of learning. I often use this simple example of a dog. When I say dog, you have an understanding of a dog. Uh, you get that. I don't have to describe what a dog is, and every time you see a dog, you don't have to learn and do what it is. You have a mental model of a dog. But an important distinction is you don't have a real dog in your head, right? It's just a mental model of a dog. <clears throat> The third uh, challenge that we run into is what I call this, the paradox of simplicity of DSRP. Um, it's a paradox because people underplay the power and richness of DSRP because it seems so simple. So when I teach DSRP, people generally say, you know, okay, I get that. I get the elements, DSRP, that's not so hard. Uh, and if it's, you know, it doesn't seem like something that can really change the way anybody thinks. Uh, but it, of course, like in many systems, Complexity is underlain by simplicity, and that's true in systems thinking too. So one of the things that we've developed uh, to help people to understand the power of DSRP is using this example of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So everybody understands a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <clears throat> Doesn't seem particularly complex or interesting. Delicious maybe, but not all that rich of an uh, object for uh, thinking. So. In workshops, we start out simply enough. I just ask people for what are the what are the parts of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you know people come up with those pretty readily. And then after a little bit, I say, okay, from what perspective are you viewing that peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And usually there's collective silence. But after a little while, uh, someone will say, I think that's from the eater's perspective that that you know that's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So I say, yeah, that I think that makes sense. So, but what are other perspectives that we could take on this peanut butter and jelly sandwich? After a little while, someone will probably say the maker perspective, which introduces uh, new parts to that uh, sandwich. Uh, the utensils get introduced. Uh, someone will else, else will say, well, maybe we could take a perspective on any one of those parts. So there could be a farmer's perspective on the bread or the trucker's perspective on the bread. And, and we work through those and understand those in different ways. In one of my recent workshops, I had a couple of folks from outside of the country say, well, those are, that's really interesting, but when I think of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it's not something to eat. We wouldn't actually eat that thing. Uh, but we do think of it as a cultural icon of the United States. So that's another interesting perspective that, that few of us think of. So we've used DSRP, simple rules of DSRP, to understand the simple peanut butter and jelly sandwich in a very interesting 
and rich way. And as we begin to go through that, we realize that to do a good job in any role that we have in peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we also have to understand other people's perspectives on it. So for example, if I'm gonna do a really good job as a peanut butter and jelly maker, I need to understand the perspective of a peanut butter and jelly eater, right? To conclude, I'll leave you with this Arthur Ashe quote, which perfectly captures how we all become better thinkers and it also addresses another challenge that I see in uh, DSRP learners. We have the tools and resources, we just need to start where we are, use, the, use DSRP and get better and smarter as we progress. Thank you.